Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is a Digital Rebar 4.9 and above training video. Specifically today, we're going to show you how to use the new Blueprint and Trigger function to enable GitOps in your organization. And we're going to walk through three different types of triggers that are enabled in Digital Rebar 4.9 and above. You must be using Digital Rebar 4.9 or above for these features to work. And what you'll see in this release is if you check the trigger providers list, there are two built-in trigger providers, one for cron, which handles time-based triggers, and another for events, which handles event-based triggers. We want to start this uh, training using some webhook tutorials, and for that we need to install the triggers plugin to get a much more a much broader range of trigger providers. So I'm going to go into my catalog. I'm going to search for the triggers provider and I'm going to go ahead and install that plugin. And with that installed, when we go back over to look at our triggers, we've enabled a lot more uh, triggers in the system. This actually allows us to take in webhooks from other systems. And if we look at our providers here, you'll see we've added a considerable list of triggers and this list is expanding all the time uh, or it could even be added by your individual system. Every one of these triggers exposes a potential webhook address under the endpoint slash webhooks interface. You have to have a matching trigger for them to webhook for them to, to act. And you'll see we have quite a number of them. Today we'll be showing the GitLab trigger, uh, although you could use any one of these numerous triggers in the system. And or of course, we'll also show you the built-in cron and event triggers. So let's let's get started with this. To do this, um, one of the things that you have to know about how uh, triggers work is that a trigger will respond to an event uh, and then call a blueprint. So when we define a new trigger, you can see I've already defined several, we would want to come in, define our trigger. We're going to call this one demo one. And then description is always nice to uh, provide. This is going to be a cron trigger. So we should actually be more descriptive. Uh, so we're going to clean up system every hour. So w this would allow us to run a check or balance or some type of, of action. And since this is a time trigger, we do want to pick our cron trigger here. And now you see I have to choose a blueprint. You can define your own blueprints. They're easy enough to create uh, or put into content packs. Uh, we have several predefined. I've installed the dev library, which gives me a dev cleanup cluster. This is literally going to run through all of the systems and clean up clusters. Uh, I have one set every night, automatically make sure I don't leave resources hanging on my, my test cluster. And for that, what I want to be able to do is run that against the it needs a place to run. These triggers are, are run by systems. I could create uh, machines for this. In this install, I've already run the self runner. So what I can do here is I can identify the machine, uh, the self runner. So this command params machine equals self runner equals true will mean that I run this filter on the self runner. Uh, should be pretty straightforward from that perspective. And um, then I get to choose the time that I want it to run. If I want it to run every minute, every hour, day, month, it's a standard cron string. So I can come in here and actually make this distinction. Once I hit save, I'm just in the wizard mode, it'll give me a chance to create a custom cron trigger. Um, this machine runs in GMT. So if I want this to go at say two in the morning, I would need to be I'm in, in central. So that would be at eight uh, GMT time. And of course I can give it uh, icons and graphics to make it distinct in other systems. When I hit save, now you'll see I'm actually in the uh, trigger editing itself. So that parameter I defined is over here. Here's the, the text of my uh, trigger string. And I can do any, any cron string I want. I could do eight and nine, so I could run it every uh, two and three in the morning uh, central time if I, if I chose to do that. And then I have some additional options that I can configure here. I can choose to uh, filter against all matches. I could uh, have two of the machines if I want to do sort of a rolling system. There's a lot of different options that you can have. And when you create that uh, parameter, or that work order, for the blueprint on this trigger, 
what will happen is I can add parameters to make that special. So if I wanted to influence that configuration or bring in a value from the trigger that was called, I can do those things um, through different configurations here. I'm not going to go through all those configurations. I just want to show you the very basics and allow you to explore building your own triggers and playing with these different features. So now this is all good. I, I've actually set this up. I'm going to show you the one that I've running already. So I have this daily cleanup task. It's exactly like what I just showed you uh, for, for how the system operates. And if I wanted to, I can then go back and look and see the work orders that have been created for that. So this is the last time this was run. You can see I have it set at 7 a.m., ran that task. I can actually get the logging, and this is the power of digital rebar. I can go in and look and see exactly what happened. Um, and if I had deleted clusters or cleaned things up, I would get a very clear log of that happening um, from that perspective. And you can see we have several things here set up to take advantage of that functionality. So that's the very basic cron trigger, super handy thing to have. The next thing I want to show you is a uh, webhook trigger. So to do that, let's go back into our triggers. We're going to create a webhook trigger for this. And this one I actually want to be able to do in conjunction with a webhook itself. Webhooks are very easy to set up. So we're going to call this one demo two. And from that perspective, we're going to pick the GitLab trigger. So we have one for a merge request trigger or a webhook trigger. So I'm going to go ahead and pick the webhook trigger. If, it, if I did it on a merge request, I could be taking actions to say test something based on when a webhook came in. Uh, same action here. I have a whole bunch of choices. What I want to do, we have one, a standard one built that allows me to do a uh, get update content from GitLab to restart clusters. Uh, super handy. This is what I built. Uh, I'm going to build one from scratch for you. Um, Digital rebar server add content from Git. This is the one we're looking at for this. This one is actually going to be able to come back and whenever there's a push, it's going to pull in that content pack and then update it, which is super handy. And for that, what I want to be able to do uh, there is build a filter for this one. Also, I need to Uh, I'm going to run it against the self runner. We're, we're going to add some UX uh, helpers for this to make it a little bit easier to find this. I'm going to, this one's a little bit smarter. So this is the same machine as my self runner. And here it says endpoint equals nothing. So in a multi site system, I could actually run a trigger here that would run all of the endpoints, whether they were my local ones or not, all of my digital rebar endpoints. Uh, in this case, it's limiting it to just my local one. So I only am going to impact my, my, my local one, but I could use this to distribute content throughout my environment. Very powerful feature from that perspective. Uh, for every webhook system, I would need a um, secret. So part of the security here is that you establish secrets on the webhooks. You want to make them secure. Uh, I have called this one demo one, two, three. It's not something I use very often, so I will be good. And then I'm going to want to know what branch I push to. Uh, these I'm going to hold for just a second because we're going to jump over to GitLab. I have a, a webhooks test repo that I have for myself. This is under my personal account. So this is the Zeehicle account that I use uh, for social media and things like that. And what you'll see here is that if I go over this one, uh, just drilling in a little bit, has a content pack defined. Uh, it's something I did for a recent webinar. So if you're interested in checking out our TechStrong webinar, where I talk about the five uh, ways to scale infrastructure as code, including the link here, then that will allow you to um, replicate or see how I use these demos in practice. This is a training, so I'm more showing you how to set them up and then rather than explaining their, their value and how they work. In GitLab here, I can go into settings, uh, pick webhooks. I already have one set up. You can see that one's listed down at the bottom. That's great. I'm going to build one completely from scratch. And so the first thing I need to be able to do is define a, a URL for that webhook. That URL is the URL of my endpoint. So right here needs to include HTTPS. There's my, there's the space. Then I need to use webhooks. So that's the entry point for all webhooks. And then you can see our, it's already completing the typing for me. So I'm going to go ahead and allow it to. 
So this is my the URL of my endpoint, webhooks, and then the trigger that I wanted to webhook to. So this is just the name of that trigger and it knows how to do that mapping. I'm gonna provide my uh, secret token, that looks great. And then what I wanna do is tell it every time there's an event that's pushed, I could do tagging, right? This is just standard uh, GitLab or webhook stuff that's gonna vary per system. Uh, I'm not going to worry about verifying. I don't have a, uh, a uh, signed certificate. I just have a self-signed certificate, so I'm doing that. That looks great. I can add this webhook, and now I have an extra webhook down at the bottom. That isn't going to do anything yet because I haven't built the receiver for that webhook. So let's go over in here, and now we need to finish doing that. So here I need to tell it where I'm getting the branch from which is this same, make sure I didn't copy in a space. So I need this, um, reap, sorry, I need my, this isn't the right one, uh, the repo URL. If I want specific branches, obviously we have settings for that. I'm just looking for the whole repo. And this allows you to use high level or very fine grained repos. So you could attach any push that you wanted out of your top level repos, or you could do it on a specific branch, or you could get push on any activity out of your, your repo. And let's see, the webhook push secret, I've got that. And let's see, I don't have an additional trigger secret for this case or a push branch. So that looks great. Go back to uh, things that are going to make it easier to see. And now I have defined this additional push. Um, and this is going to allow me to, now I don't have to use this get from content. If I wanted to, I could just put in a dev wait time and run a wait time task. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, it's not as useful as rebuilding all the content every time, but it's going to be very easy for me to test the op the actions coming along in here. Dev wait time just runs a, a wait uh, cycle. We use it as a sort of a um, hello world or a, a test loop all the time. And then you'll see that the parameters that I defined are right over here uh, where you would expect them to be in our normal UX. So at this point, I should be able to now take that, go over to my new webhook. These look identical, uh, except I didn't uh, do all the same tagging. That's fine. And I can now test the push events action. And if that worked correctly, what, what would happen is I would see a work order created which is exactly what I see with my wait time action. So here I can see live that uh, when the webhook fired, I actually got the right event and then I'm running the right action and I'm, I'm literally getting the output from that as we go. Uh, if I came back over fast enough, yeah, you can see it's just cycling. The, what that action does is just cycle the icons back on, on the machine target. So I've been able to verify that the webhook worked. I've been able to verify that um, it sparked a web order, test it, verify that the security was right. If the security wasn't right or something wasn't matching, uh, the webhook would tell me and I'd be able to continue to troubleshoot. So pretty straightforward process to build these things. Um, I've done this a couple times, so of course it's easy for me to sort of pop through it. When you build any integrations between systems, plan time to test and troubleshoot and figure out what's going on. It's one of the things why it's nice for me to show you not doing actions here, but actually building a test system. So I can just make sure that the integration is working before I worry about anything else. One thing to note, if I came back to this work order, uh, I'm showing you the activity, but I could also show you the parameters that were set. So if I define input parameters, um, there's a lot of information besides just did it work or not, but how it was actually built or what was defined in, as part of doing that work um, that's important to understand in, in how you build these. And of course, it's always worth mentioning that work orders are actually spawning jobs. And so what we actually saw was a work order that then started, in this case, just one, but could have started a series of jobs uh, or could have started a series of uh, work orders on multiple machines if I had it configured that way. So at this point we have covered the cron and the uh, and, and a webhook. I want to show you one last uh, trigger that is super handy. 
because then sometimes you don't want to have a trigger that does a whole bunch of actions or you want a trigger that doesn't action say reevaluate your your content but then you don't want the content reevaluation to be done on a secondary system so what what we can do here is actually build an event trigger and that event trigger allows us to wait for something to happen and let me show you how that looks so this is my third demo i'll call it demo three and here we're going to pick the event trigger. Excellent. And then from a blueprint perspective, uh, we can keep these also very um, lightweight. Just do this dev wait time. And here, instead of doing it for every, uh, for against the self runner, I want to do it against clusters that I've already built. So let me show you how that would look. Uh, when I go through, I'm going to pick, um, all of my cluster machines. So this would be, I'll actually use the cluster reevaluate. Uh, we have a built in task that does this. So if you wanted to reevaluate uh, a cluster or machines every single time that uh, something got changed in the system, say I changed the cluster size, that's what I show in, in, the, in the demo, uh, you would use this event trigger. So here it's saying, I want all of the machines that are cluster machines. If I picked a uh, machine or broker, or self runner, I could also do those actions against those machines. Um, I could even pick a specific machine's name. So if I, I put in name equals something, uh, I could do that. Or if I had parameters defining roles or profiles or things like that, I could, I could limit this to a subset of my overall environment, in this case, all the machines. And then I want to match a certain set of, of triggers. And we have a pattern for this that we use if you ever wonder what the triggers are, let me show you a little bit about how you can see what that looks like. If I click over here, this is the uh, shows me all the events that are happening in the system uh, at the moment. And so I can actually watch and subscribe to events. But the way the system operates, everything, uh, every update, create, delete event is going to caught be is going to trigger an event that you can you can monitor. You can monitor this from the CLI and you can take actions or wait for events and uh, put make that part of your automation. It's exactly what we're doing here. So I'm saying whenever the contents are created or updated for any object, that's how to read this this uh, triple, then I want to take additional actions. I could put in contents or machines. I could put in uh, blueprints or triggers or work orders or uh, you know machines when a cluster is updated in itself. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to play with this system. And, and take actions from that, or even do it down to a specific machine. Here, what I'm just going to do is, is wait for those single triggers uh, to go ahead and do a cluster reevaluate. Uh, once again, I'm going to switch this not to reevaluate, but to do a wait time, keep things a little bit uh, more straightforward here, and use the same settings, make this one blue. And uh, once again, we have the option to filter all matches. In this case, I do want to filter all the matches. That would mean that all of the clusters are going to be reevaluated, not just one chosen at random. Excellent. So I made that change. It's already saved. That looks great. And here, what I'm able to do, uh, I need to create a cluster for you. So if we add a test cluster, uh, stick with the naming, demo four here. Uh, we're going to just create a simple base cluster using our context broker. So it's super fast for me to spin up new uh, new clusters, keeping with our themes. Excellent. So this is going to spin up a very, a very simple uh, cluster with a couple of machines in it. And we will see that go through in just a moment. Uh, from that process, what will happen is that um, we can now trigger actions to happen based on an update to a content pack. So in because of the way I have these triggers set, if I was to go back into this repository and make any change to this repository at all, every, anything from a readme file to actually changing uh, information about the cluster, it would then generate that push change. Now, Nice thing here is I don't actually have to make any changes to show you how this works. I can come back into the webhooks and I can uh, do a test run. Let's see if we're at a good a good point for this and generate a, 
an, uh, an event that will cause things to change. Oh, uh, wait, actually, I speak incorrectly because uh, I'm doing the push. Um, it won't necessarily change the content pack. So uh, we're going to force a content pack to change just by loading in a new content pack at random. I can't do this until the system has actually reached its cluster provision. So um, I'm waiting a little bit for those new machines to show up in the system, which is exactly what's going on here. The resource brokers for that content provider. Uh, looks like I've already completed the work and we're just waiting for the machines to show up. So once I clear the filter, I can you can see that I have the uh, machines here and ready. That's excellent. I have the uh, cluster finishing its provisioning cycle. That looks great. And so all I really need to do now is spark the event that would cause me to reevaluate the triggers. And so I can do that simply by adding a new catalog item here. Uh, I pick any one. This one looks great. I pick the billing one. And so when this content comes in and changes, we should now be seeing our cluster reevaluate uh, the 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 overall cluster provision, and that's exactly it happened very quickly. That's exactly what we saw happen from those work orders that we had set uh, to happen, and uh, that's exactly how we want these systems to be behaving. So we are able to take a event within Digital Rebar and then cause other actions to cascade from that to very targeted sources. We can do a webhook that brings in events as we go. And of course, we can set up things in a timer. Uh, if you're asking about the missing piece, which is how does Digital Rebar callback out to other systems, we actually have a plugin for that. You build a task and then you use the callback plugin to push out to systems. So it is not, it is very trivial to be able to build a callback into other systems. We've been able to do that for quite some time using the callback plugin. The new features that I wanted to train you on here are how to build your own triggers uh, into the system. And it should be pretty straightforward. So you now have the tools you need to go through and build three core kinds of triggers using Digital Rebar 4.9. Hope this training has been helpful. We have a lot more content about how to build the triggers, uh, do cloud integrations, uh, run the system, bare metal, you name it. We have a lot of training for it. But we always want to hear your feedback on these training sessions. And if there is something missing, let us know because we will happily extend our training library and uh, help you come up to speed with the system. If you have any questions, please contest, contact us at racken.com, uh, join our Slack community and be part of infrastructure as code at scale with us. Thank you.